Eleanor Roosevelt said, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. This morning, I'd like to discuss with you some ideas I have on leaders and leadership. Next slide. Some of you may be familiar with the initiatives hashtag I look like a surgeon or hashtag I look like an engineer. I've assigned a hashtag to this talk. It's hashtag I look like a leader. If you're familiar, you'll understand. If you're not familiar, look it up, take a read. I think you'll find it very interesting, very powerful. I'd like to start with a story. I had just finished residency training in emergency medicine in Boston. I decided I wanted to take a year to work in the community. There was this one place that was a really good place to work. Great salary, great benefits, great colleagues, great patient care. You get the sense. I sat for my interview, and the chairman in charge of the department told me there were three reasons why he did not want to hire me. Number one, I was a new residency graduate, and he didn't like to hire people just out of residency. He wanted people with some experience. Number two, he had had no experience with hiring people from my program. My program was the newer program in the city. And number three, he told me he didn't want to hire me because I'm a woman. He said he had not very good luck with women because they tend to get pregnant. True story. I didn't say anything. I smiled, and I thought, I actually have a lot of respect for this guy. I don't think he's unique. I think he just actually is saying aloud what a lot of people think. This was 2001, and I thought, we're just not there yet. I had seen much more gender equity in pediatrics and in psychiatry, but I thought, emergency medicine, we're just not there yet. So leadership. I think leadership is a trait, a behavior of an individual. It's something we recognize when we see it. You know it like you know a good melon. There are those of us that are leaders and those of us that are followers. No one can be a leader at all times and no one can be a follower at all times. I think that we can agree that inherently, leadership is not a male thing and being a follower is not a female thing. What I'd like to share with you is five lessons I've learned about being a leader and about leadership. These five lessons are lessons that everybody will be able to relate to. First, there's never a need to publicly embarrass someone. Always give the person an out, pull them aside, and speak with them privately. I'll never forget one of my first experiences with public embarrassment. I was 14 years old, and I had a summer job as a bus girl. For those of you that don't know what that is, it means essentially I worked at a small breakfast restaurant that served ice cream, and I cleaned up. Cleaned up the dishes, washed the dishes, wiped down the tables, everything in the back. The owner was known to be not very nice. In fact, she was pretty, pretty mean, very strict. You were not allowed to eat the food. If you broke any dishes and if you broke any glasses, you had to pay for them. One day, she was having breakfast with three of her women friends, and they were sitting at a round table. She came to the back, and she said, Risa, could you come up here a minute? I said, sure. I walked out, and I came to the table, and she brought me to the table with all of her friends. She said, did you clean this table? I said, yes. She said, give me your hand. And she took my hand, and she put her hand on top of my hand and made me feel all around the side of the round table and you could feel dried food, dried ice cream. It wasn't clean. She looked at me, she smiled, and then she said, now that is not clean. And I thought, wow. She purposely pulled me out and did this in front of her friends. She this, did this to me on purpose. She was right, it wasn't clean. But I said to myself, I'll never do that to someone. You just don't do that. So then I read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Still a classic, even though it was published in 1936. He actually talks about this concept of giving people an out, speaking with them privately. People know when they've done something. I was working in the emergency department one day 
we had a patient that came in. He was clinically intoxicated, had a history of polysubstance abuse, said he was suicidal. So we medically stabilized him. We were waiting for him to sober up. And we called a psychiatry consultation. I saw the psychiatry attending come in. He was sort of the proud peacock walking with his team. He had a medical student and a psychiatry resident in tow. I saw them walk in the department, walk around, walk by the patient's door, did not stop, did not speak with the patient, and came right up to the physician's desk. He said, oh, we know this guy. You can send him home. He's not suicidal. He's just a dirt bag. The psychiatry resident shriveled. The emergency medicine resident that was sitting next to me, his mouth opened, jaw ajar, eyes popping out ahead, didn't say anything. I felt this overwhelming sense of emotion well up inside me. I said to the attending, can I speak with you a minute? He said, sure. I pulled him aside and we went into a room, spoke in private. I proceeded to remind him that he was modeling for physicians in training. I told him, from my perspective, I didn't care what his personal views were. There was absolutely positively no place for that kind of language, that I didn't want to ever hear him speaking like that again speaking about patients, speaking in front of patients, residents, me. Nowhere was this type of language okay in the emergency department. If he had a tail, I would say his tail was between his legs. He kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And in that moment, I think he respected and appreciated that I had pulled him aside and spoke with him. He knew what he did. It wasn't because of my reprimand. Going forward, he never spoke like that again. It wasn't just me. My other attending colleagues and res residents noted that there was a difference with the way he performed his consultations, with the way he professionally interacted. Number two, make a decision. Being indecisive is perceived worse than making a wrong choice. So this is one that didn't come naturally to me. And in fact, I kind of had it brought up to me on a few occasions where I thought I was being decisive but I was being perceived as indecisive. I was a resident doctor working with an attending that worked a lot of shifts. He was chronically sleep deprived, picked up a lot of mood lighting, and always spoke with a bit of edge. One day he said to me, Lewis, what's the one thing you need to do? I mean, this came out of nowhere. I had no idea what he was talking about. What's the one thing you need to do? It was like a game of guess what I'm thinking. He said, you can never lose your cool. You have to be in control, you have to stand to the head of the bed, and you need to make a decision. And I thought, I'm an emergency physician. I don't have a hard time making a decision. But I've had enough instances where I've been perceived as not being decisive. You could argue, anecdotally, that actually this is more of a perception of women versus men. We think differently, we communicate differently. We all know this. Perhaps it's that I talk aloud, I talk out my thoughts to kind of engage people in the conversation, let them know what I'm thinking, and I welcome people's input. However, I've realized, and this is not just as an emergency physician, but in terms of leader and leadership physicians, people want you to make a decision and avoid this sort of perception that you're indecisive. Number three, think of yourself as a slice of Swiss cheese. Perhaps it's Emmental or Guayer, depending on your cheese choice, but you get the concept. You're a piece of cheese and you've got holes. Know your strengths and build on those. Know your weaknesses and identify people for whom those are strengths. Bring those people onto your team. So I think when we're placed in these leadership positions, we think we have to be Superman or Wonder Woman. We need to be strong and we need to be, be able to take care of everything. But I think over time, one of the lessons regarding being a leader and leadership is self-reflecting. Learn your strengths. Be comfortable in your strengths and build on those. Identify what your weaknesses are and look for people to join your team. People that you've identified have their strengths are your weaknesses. So for instance, I'm not a researcher. If you were to look at my CV or my promotion pathway in the academic track, it doesn't say NIH grant funded, uh, and it does not say researcher. So I was actually told uh, at my prior job that that was a weakness of my program. It really wasn't producing in that way. I went to my research director, and I said, would you be willing to come once a month to our meeting? We hold weekly meetings, but I just was going to have make a, 
a once a month lab session. And he said, sure, no one had ever asked this of him before. This completely revolutionized our product productivity. We were able to discuss research questions, research projects. He helped us navigate the IRB. We collected data, we analyzed data, we wrote manuscripts, we published. So I carry this over my current job. Same thing, I approached the research director. He was absolutely positively complimented. He joined our team, he's now a part of our team. He actually has thought that it's such a good idea that he now visits and has a research meeting with all the different programs and uh, subspecialties within our Department of Emergency Medicine. It builds networking, it builds camaraderie, and it builds you as a leader. Number four. Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So leadership is not about hierarchy. It's about instilling confidence and respect and making people feel truly a part of your team. I was working in the emergency department one day and it was very busy, it was an evening shift, and one of the EKG techs handed me an EKG. It looked concerning. Resident had just come on, I handed her the EKG, and I said, this EKG looks concerning. Can you go see the patient? It took this resident a year to build up the courage to approach me. She said, you know that time, the time that you hand me the EKG and told me to go see the patient? I had just arrived, I hadn't taken my coat off, you essentially handed me the EKG and said, go see the patient. Now, it doesn't matter exactly what I said, what I didn't say, what I did, and what I didn't do. It became very clear in that moment how I had made her feel. I didn't feel her, make her feel welcome. I didn't make her feel respected. I didn't make her feel a part of the team. Only when you truly, truly listen, truly, truly demonstrate empathy, and truly understand the perspective of people on your team, people who report to you, your subordinates, people who you're building up, building that respect, building confidence, will they want to follow your lead? Number five, ask. So I am a reader, and there's a really, book, a really good book that I'd recommend for everybody. It's called Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide. It's by an author named Linda Babcock. When I started reading more about leaders and leadership and what people do, there's this general theme, like people ask. Essentially, you're in your position for a reason. You're supposed to advocate for your program, advocate for your people, and oh yeah, advocate for yourself. But first you have to get over and sort of normalize this thing called the imposter syndrome. Most of you probably have heard of the imposter syndrome, and if you haven't heard of it, you can kind of figure out what it means. It's this sense that somehow you're in your position, you were asked to be a leader by accident, that you're really not supposed to be there, you're not qualified. You somehow fooled people and they're gonna find you out. So studies show that women have more, well, suffer from the imposter syndrome more than men, although it's not unique to women. A lot of us have it and it depends on where we are in our life and our stages. So if you're placed in this position or asked to take on a leadership position, it's for a reason. It's because of behaviors you've demonstrated, competencies, communications, ability to manage people. You have to trust yourself. You have to trust your gut. Then you're able to start doing this asking. One of my male friends said to me one time, Risa, you should be absolutely positively embarrassed by what you ask for, and then you still haven't asked for enough. So I decided I was gonna try this out. I started asking my chairman for things. I asked him if I could get protected time for my faculty. He said yes. I said, can I have dedicated scan ships for my fellows? He said yes. I said, will you support my going to this simulation training so I can work on feedback and communication? He said yes. So I actually received a yes a lot. And the more I asked, the easier it became. You realize at some point, the worst someone can say is no, and then you won't have the regret of not having put forward the ask. It becomes easier. I was having a mentor look at my CV, 
again, on this academic promotion track, and I asked him, is there anything that he sees that I need to work on? Any flags, any missing holes? He said, you know, Risa, you're not a journal reviewer for any journals. And I said, yeah, you're right. And he said, why is that? I said, well, how do you become a reviewer? I've never been asked. I had this sense that these things happen by divine intervention. And he said, you have to ask. And I was like, oh. He said, yeah, just write to the editor and ask them if you can be a journal reviewer. I said, oh. So I wrote a few emails to a few different emergency medicine journals, and I became a reviewer. It was this eureka. It was like being let in on this secret that actually people put themselves forward. People ask. So it goes back to these behaviors that are natural versus learned behaviors. And this learning to ask and being comfortable with asking was one of the biggest lessons, I would say, of these five. So back to leadership, leaders and leadership. At the end of the day, I think we all value gender equality. I think we believe that we should have women leaders, we should have men leaders, we should have diversity in leadership because that makes teams better, more productive, and it's something that we should all seek for. It's something we want, but we're not there. I've come up with some things that I think we can all do, some action items to help work on this specific issue. Mentor and sponsor. So these are sort of trendy catchphrases these days. What exactly do they mean? Well, mentorship and being a mentor means having a bit of a personal relationship with someone where you coach them, will you advise them. So for instance, you go through someone's CV and give them feedback on how to improve, how to adjust, how to edit their CV. Perhaps someone's giving a lecture and you run through it with them. You give them feedback, you give them pointers on how to tighten up their speech. Sponsorship is a little bit more difficult, and some of my friends say that they think it's actually the more important of the two. So if you sponsor someone, that means you're in a leadership or a power position where you can advocate on someone's behalf. You may not actually have a personal relationship with them, but you have the ability to place them in positions. So if there's a committee and you need to appoint chairs of committee, say you're organizing a conference and you're selecting the speakers for that conference. There are many opportunities. Think about asking. Think about asking women the next time you are organizing a conference. Think about when you're uh, inviting a grand round speaker. How about if you're writing a paper and you need some co-authors? This is a call also to the women in the audience. It's not just being asked. It's like I said, things don't happen by divine intervention. You need to ask. Ask your mentors, ask your chair, can I sit on a committee? I'd like to give a lecture. Will you support my? Think about the things you can do. There's a great initiative, some of you may be familiar, called Feminine, Women in Emergency Medicine, and there'll be a lecture about that tomorrow. There's a speakers bureau. Sign yourself up for the speakers bureau. Have yourself listed as a speaker. Next, identify your unconscious bias. So I shared with you the story of the chair that told me my three strikes, why he didn't want to hire me. So you could argue that's not really an unconscious bias. That's pretty conscious. It's pretty out there. I want to put it out there. Pregnancy is not a disability. It's not a disability. Yet, <laughs> different countries that are at different stages of evolution when it comes to the workforce, the workplace, and how we, we ne navigate, negotiate women who are pregnant and maternity leave. I'm not gonna quote numbers or statistics, but suffice it to say that in 2001, I was told that I was a risk. And just two weeks ago, a friend of mine told her chair that she's pregnant with her second child. He became angry and he said, that's it. I'm not hiring any more women. I have a friend in California who's an emergency physician, and about a month before her delivery, she stopped receiving emails. These were emails regarding a committee that she co-chaired and she organized. She wasn't receiving the meeting agendas, the meeting summary notes, or the dates for the next meetings. She asked her co-chair what was going on, and he said, well, you're pregnant, so we didn't want to bother you. Ask. 
Ask women what they'd like. Don't make a decision for them. We all have our unconscious bias. Try to figure out what yours is and act on that. That's one of the actions we can take. Finally, do your reading, do your homework. This is a strategy table. It's a strategy for gender equity from a recent editorial entitled Gender Equality in Emergency Medicine, Ignorance Isn't Bliss. This was published recently in the Emergency Medicine Journal of Australasia. Here they break down strategies, individual, institutional, and college and society level for what we can do. So that chair, the one who told me I had three strikes, he hired me. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because he identified certain behaviors. Maybe he was willing to come to terms with his conscious bias. Leadership is a behavior of an individual. It's not just for men. Hashtag I look like a leader. Hashtag you all look like a leader too. Thank you very much. So, fantastic work. Thank you, Risa. Uh, Tim, thoughts, comments, questions? Look, fantastic talk. Look, I'll just put a couple to you. Nat Sylvie, um, she says, we, we've now got... Uh, it, her question really is, why is it so difficult for, uh, to enable women into leadership roles despite the change in gender balance in medicine now? You know, I think it, um, it's both sides. It's the people that are in the position to ask and to create the opportunities. But I think it's sort of like playing golf on the golf course or somehow being told the inside scoop. We just don't know. And I gave that example of the, the journal editor. I thought somehow you get asked. Uh, I think learning how things work is one of the ways to navigate it. I'll, I'll say anecdotally, uh, last year I was part of the American College of Emergency Physicians ultrasound and I specifically was trying to get more women on subcommittees and task forces, and they were very surprised that I called them and asked them. They didn't think they had the experience, they didn't think they had the time or energy for a national level engagement. And once I sort of broke it down that it was maybe a meeting quarterly or a meeting every six months, and maybe an attendance in person once a year, but even then that was not required, it seemed very doable. A lot of this stuff is very doable once you find out what work is required. I'll take another one um, from Bishan. He asks, as a junior doctor, what can you do if you see a senior publicly embarrassing uh, mm -hmm. another trainee? You know, the public, that was very powerful. Like, you know, um, I knew that was my aha moment when I saw, when this guy, he like, I was like, Risa, this is your moment. You need to call this guy out. And, you know, Actions speak, we all know that. I think if you see a senior, one, there are many approaches obviously, but I think if I were in a position of being a junior, seeing a senior publicly embarrassed, I might sort of switch the role. I may ask the senior, can I speak with you a, mo a moment? I mean, it would take a lot of, you'd have to have a lot of gall, but I think you could, do, so one thing would be to pull the senior aside and speak with them about it. You know, I think maybe if you knew another senior with whom you felt comfortable, you could speak with the senior about it and have the senior have a senior to senior discussion. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a few approaches. It depends on your level of comfort. All right, and I think I would just sort of add to some of those comments. I think it is also worth celebrating wins. And if I might just call out Chris Nixon here, what you've seen here at SMAC is some excellent women in a very high proportion speaking. So I think congratulations to Chris, supported by the organising committee. Thank you. And while we're looked at, uh, we better just thank Risa for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.